You wanted action, drama? Well, you've got it. Pre-Olympic team selection storylines are running at a fever pitch right now, with multiple events currently boasting more qualified athletes than spots. One of my favorites right now is the men's 5,000, and keep in mind by the time you listen to this, everything could have drastically changed, but right now, we have three athletes with the qualifying time standard in Mohamed and his 1258 leading the charge, and Justin Knight and Matt Hughes right behind him. Now, Hughes is more likely to focus on the steeple, meaning that there may be a spot open still. And right now, you have the next fastest runner with quota, Ben Flanagan, as well as the slightly slower but higher ranked Kieran Lum. Now, to make things extra spicy, between the two of them time-wise, there's currently the out-of-rankings Luke Boucher, and still a bit of time before the team is announced with fast European, domestic, and American races completely on the table. As well, there's a huge points opportunity at the National Championships. What we're about to watch unfold is strategy, guesswork, and a whole lot of pure guts racing, and as an athletics fan, totally here for it. In that vein, we are joined by one of the runners in contention, Ben Flanagan. He currently trains with the Boston Reebok TC. He's the 2018 NCAA 10,000 meter champ, and he joins us to chat about learning the secrets of the 5K, a look at a longer future, alternate universes where he isn't the NCAA champion, and a sneak peek at the inner workings of teammate Justin Knight's season. My name is Michael Brokus, and this week on the Terminal Mile, we talk with Ben Flanagan. All right, big result for you, uh, a 13-20-67 at at a twilight meet. Um, One thing that that I've really noticed about this, though, is that uh, your progression this season has been, you know, getting a little bit faster and a little bit faster as as you come up to a time when when those results are really, really going to matter. I think I've heard this Ben Flanagan story before. Talk to me, you know, like, like how, how is training going right now and, and how are you feeling about it? And, uh, you know, how are you feeling about it compared to say a couple of years ago when you're getting ready for, for that big show? Yeah. Uh, Michael stoked to be uh, talking with you today and, uh, such a great, uh, place to kind of kick things off. So, uh, I appreciate the, uh, props for the performance. Um, super stoked about it. Uh, you know, honestly, when I got to the track in Massachusetts, I was looking at the weather and, You know, I saw nine degrees, rainy, you know, 20 kilometer hour winds. And I was like, man, this is a time where I kind of need performances to like, there's few opportunities left to like really make my name stand out. Um, But fortunately, like I just felt good on the day and the race actually was set up great. The weather held off and uh, walking away with the 1320 and given all the context, I was so pumped about. So in terms of the progression, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a number of things, you know, it's, it's definitely um, a question that I think could come with a bit, a few layers to answer. Um, you know, one thing is like the 5K, I honestly haven't run that much throughout my career. Like when I was in high school, I ran 3K. College, you know, I was injured most indoor seasons and I got in the 10K game pretty early that um, I never really figured out the 5K and I, it wasn't until Drake a few weeks ago when I ran 1325 that I was like, all right, I actually feel like I'm starting to figure out this distance. So, um, for me, the, the intensity, like getting down to 64s, like those are, those are splits that are intimidating. And I think they just take me quite a long time to get used to. And I would love to say that, like, I purposely timed it this way, but at the same time, man, like I would have loved to run 1320 a month ago, but the body just wasn't ready for it. So, um, coming out of this race, there's been a sense of relief that it's like, okay, things are heading in the right direction, like right when I need them to. Yeah. yeah. One, one thing that I got from that, that I found, you know, to be pretty interesting was, was kind of that, that self-talk, uh, and, and that inner monologue and stuff, you know, you're, you're training with, uh, with the Reebok Boston club, uh, talk to me, you know, like what, what kind of sports psychology setup do they have down there? Is, is that something that, that you guys, you know, put a lot of emphasis in? Um, not through like direct, um, oh, what's the word? Like affiliate, like we don't have mm. a sports or a, or a sponsored psych that we work with or a person that's dedicated to us for the team. Um, that's definitely something that I feel like, um, if an athlete feels like it's something that, uh, benefits them, which a lot of athletes do, um, I think they personally seek out. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it didn't take you long to pick up on the way my brain works, but, uh, you know, I, I went to the university of Michigan. I was, uh, you know, head of our, our student athlete council for mental health. I'm a social work grad. So, you know, I'm, I'm all about, uh, the positive self-talk and making sure, you know, the head's on straight and you feel good about yourself and, uh, you know, training your brain to really take on these, these hard tasks. So, um, and even I could do a better job, but, um, it's something that I've probably been increasingly putting more commitment to. I feel like it's something I've could have always benefited on and benefited from, but I actually haven't taken advantage of it as much as I wish I had. Um, in Michigan, we had a great setup and I didn't utilize it that much. Um, and then through Athletics Canada and some personal connections I have, I have some resources available that um, I've only recently started utilizing and it's been really um, helpful. Um, so. Uh, I can't speak for the rest of the team, but uh, for me, um, you know, working with someone from a more psychological perspective has been beneficial. You know, another thing that I want to touch on was, uh, you know, watching watching your progression this season. Uh, it seems like there's been a lot of stock put in, into the 5,000. You said you're, you're kind of figuring things stuff out uh, there now. What uh, what made you pick the the five thousand over the ten thousand? I know I know you had a had a good ten thousand this year, but you know why did you why did you choose uh, you know to throw all your stock into the five thousand? One hundred percent. That's such a good question because it actually has a very uh, like deliberate answer behind it. Mm. Um, so you know naturally. Um, We've all kind of kept tabs on. For anyone that doesn't follow the sport, you know, as closely as a track nerd like myself does, <laughs> um, you know, this Olympic cycle is different than all the others because we introduced the ranking system. So now mm. athletes can qualify from this super standard that they may or may not hit, but also can get in off of rankings. Um, the other big difference with this Olympic championship compared to the past is they've cut the 10K field size way down. So there's only 27 athletes in it. So my I talked to my agent Dan Lilo who's a big stats guy big track nerd he's you know this is one of the best things he's he you know he's the best in the game for stuff like this he's such an expert of the sport and a while ago he actually you know suggested to me he's like I don't know if you're gonna love this but based on the situation of of where the sport's heading right now your best interest might be actually focusing on the 5k um which the challenge with that is it's one of Canada's top events so um I understood that the 10k um, probably from like a national perspective, would it give me a better chance to qualify, um, you know, to be one of the top like three ranked athletes in Canada compared to the five. But basically because the limited field size in the 10, you have to hit that super standard because all the athletes hit it in the field size. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? So basically like the way it was designed is 50% hit the super standard, 50% hit the rankings. That was the goal. And what happened is everyone in the 10K hit the rankings. Right. So at this time, the only way to make it in the 10K is to hit the super standard of 2728, which I haven't hit. So although it's very likely I'll be ranked top three in Canada and could potentially go and win the trials, I actually wouldn't qualify for the Olympics. Uh, whereas the reverse is true in the 5K where I'm checked all the boxes to qualify for the Olympics. And now my biggest problem is making sure I'm one of the top three in Canada because it's just so, so competitive right now. Right. Right. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to talk about, uh, you know, all the rankings and that sort of stuff, uh, coming up in, in just a second. But before we move on, I, I do, I do want to talk a little bit more about that, uh, about your, your most recent PB, uh, and the twilight there. Uh, I was, re I was reading in, in the Sidious race, uh, recap, uh, from their newsletter a little bit earlier this week. And of course, if, if people don't follow that, I would, uh, I would highly suggest it. Uh, it's really good writing there. Um, but it, it mentioned that, that mother nature had, uh, some, some different plans as far as a fast track meet goes, uh, you know, how, how did things go, uh, in, in that regard for you? Uh, you know, as, as far as the race goes, you know, what, what were the conditions like? And, and like, do you, do you have the belief that, that maybe you could, you know, even go a little bit faster than what, what you did? For sure. Um, yeah, it was, um, it wasn't ideal, you know, it's like yeah. from, from, from the position I've been in through my time at the University of Michigan to Reebok, like super privileged career. We were able to, you know, spend money to fly out to California to run in, you know, 17 degree weather, no wind, no humidity, like as good as it gets. Um, and this case, um, you know, the race was supposed to be set up really well. I knew Ben True was there. 
Um, so it seemed like a great opportunity. And as time got closer, it kind of just looked like the the weather just wasn't going to pan out great, um, which is something I've become increasingly concerned about throughout my career because, you know, you like realize you only get one or two shots a season to like really go for those real fast times. Um, so when I saw that, you know, I really just kind of going back to some of the things we talked about earlier in terms of being in the right headspace, I was just like, this is just out of my control. You know, I'm, I'm in this race, I'm going to Boston. Um, I'm not in Portland this weekend. I'm going to Boston, whatever the weather is like, I don't have a choice at this point. You know, I've got maybe two or three races left or maybe one race left before the Olympic trials. Like I've got to make this opportunity count no matter what. So although it was on my mind, I was just like, try not to worry about it and just see how the race plays out. Um, and it just went great. I mean, you know, literally the first lap coming through in 63, I was like, okay, this feels okay. Like I can do this. And, you know, it was just about setting those incremental benchmarks. All right, just get to 3k on the pacers, get to 4k on the pacers. And with three laps ago is where I kind of started to lick my chops a little bit and thinking like, oh, wow, like I felt like this before. And like, I know what I can do in the last, you know, 400 meters if mm -hmm. I feel this good when the bell hits. And sure enough, it did. And I felt good. And I knew it was time to just kind of lay it all out there and try to uh, run as fast as I could uh, on the day. And um, super stoked. And I, I really hope there's more in the tank. I believe I can run faster and another circumstance. And, uh, you know, that's the goal is to just kind of keep momentum in the right direction. Yeah, that that's one thing that that I've really noticed is is last uh, last little bit the uh, you, you know it's it's not not just that you're running well but but like you're you're hitting you know the the W's you also got fourth place in there you know like you you've been you've been coming near the top which is has been so so crucial especially with with uh, rankings and that sort of stuff and I I think that's the, the direction I want to go next I mean right now you are uh, ranked at at forty four uh, which. Uh, puts you behind Kieran Lum, who is currently 23rd, and then we have three with the the super standard: uh, Matt Hughes, Justin Knight, and Mo Ahmed. Uh, if I were a betting man, and I think most people would agree with me, uh, Matt Hughes will will probably be focusing uh, on the steeple, so uh, we we can take him out, which leaves kind of that that last spot there that will come down to to rankings. Uh, now again, Chris did a, a pretty good uh, job of going through that in in the the Sidious, uh newsletter this week. Uh, but I want to hear it from from you. I mean, the a national championship victory could potentially be very good for your uh, road to Tokyo. So, what are the options right now? Yeah, uh, amazing question and. Uh... I promise you it has been on my mind quite a bit recently. <laughs> so, uh, you know, credit again, you know, it's, you got to give credit to the guys right now, like, every, and the women. I mean, everyone's showing up like crazy in the, in the 5,000 in particular. Across Canada, the athletes are, of course, um, stepping up. But uh, being a distance athlete and following the 5K has been amazing to, mm -hmm. to see, like, it's the best problem for Canadian Olympic selection to have, right? Is there's too many people like that's a great problem to have. And I'm really, I'm really happy that that's the state of the sport right now. That being said, <laughs> I want to be on the team. So, uh, yeah. So the biggest thing is, you know, Kieran's running great. Um, and honestly going into that Boston meet, well, let me, let me take it one step further. So mm -hmm. my understanding at this point is Athletics Canada is going to choose three athletes based on a number of variables. There's there's a wide range. It's you know head-to-head -head competition, fastest time, past experience, national championships. So it's a whole lot of things. The goal is to just prove to them that you're capable of being the one of the best people to represent the team. Mm -hmm. um, now going into Boston, I know one thing is very likely not going to change from now until the trials. And my world ranking is 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 very unlikely to surpass Kieran's. Um, just the way the algorithm works, um, there's just no racing opportunities that are going to give me that good of points unless I decide to break Mo's Canadian record, which I would love to do, <laughs> but I don't think it's in the cards right this moment. So um, going into Boston, the biggest thing I want to do is to at least run faster. Like if I could run mm. faster than Kieran's time, that would at least give me, you know, one box checked over, over him right now. Right. And so, you know, he beat me at Drake running 1324 and I was all eyes in on 1324. And with three laps to go, I kept looking at the clock and was like, all right, can I afford to sit one more lap? Yeah. Can I afford to sit one more lap? 
Yep. And then on the last lap, I was like, all right, make this as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, because I also want to set the bar high enough that Luke Brashe or Kieran um, have a challenge, you know, trying to surpass me there. So, so that was one thing that was really beneficial from this meet. Um, that being said, um, you know, I do think Athletics Canada will put a lot of weight on a national championship. So that's something I'm, I'm really strongly considering. Um, obviously some challenges that come with that, uh, returning to Canada to, uh, go to that meet, but, um, it's something I'm super interested in doing. Uh, the only other option outside of that right now, given, you know, the limited racing schedule is to go chase a super fast time. And I know there's a meet out in France that's going to go hot. Um, I hear about some races in the U S that are trying to be set up for athletes to have one more shot. Um, so I'm going to look a further, a little bit further into those options and basically decide, okay, do I have a shot at running under 13, 13.5 for the super standard? If so, maybe it'd be worth chasing uh, that time. But at the same time, hopping in any of those races is probably going to sacrifice um, the ability to, you know, come home and meet all the benchmarks I need to to go to the trials, uh, which I do think is very valuable and important to me as well as trying to win, a, you know, the Olympic trials. So those are the options right now. And, um, you know, that's TBD. But uh, over the next couple of weeks, I should have a plan uh, together to make sure I'm, you know, I'm ready to capitalize on whichever opportunity seems the best. All right, that's uh, that's that's definitely res respectable. A lot of options uh, there on the sure. table right now. Uh, you know, speaking of of some of the people in that uh, that super standard, one of them is your teammate Justin Knight. Uh, he's he's kind of been doing some some interesting things this year with a lot of fifteen hundreds uh, in there. Uh, maybe you could could shed a little bit of light on the on the strategy behind that. I'd I'd be interested to hear about it. For sure. Um... You know, uh, Justin, you know, is an incredible athlete. That 1309 he ran a couple years ago um, put him in a great situation where he had the standard, one of the best times, a super competitive time that's tough to beat, um, makes him a really good selection for Team Canada most likely. Um, and with that, he had the opportunity to kind of experiment a little bit with the season and really take control of it and try things that he thought would benefit him. And, uh, you know, last summer, Justin, I think, was just looking at these these – world um contenders like the the Jakob Ingerbrigsons of the world mm -hmm. uh the Stewie Stewie Mack uh Stuart McSwain um you know let me think of maybe a couple others even like Grant Fisher Sean McGordy and um what he was noticing is they're all running 1500s and they're running them fast you know Stewie Mack's run 331 Jakob's run I mean 329 I believe at this point and I think Justin you know Justin really sets high goals and expectations for himself and um, considering those are the athletes he wants to be capable of competing with, my understanding is he thought, okay, I need to do, you know, I need to be able to run a 1500 in, in under 335. And uh, he started trying it. And I think, you know, the first couple, he kept winning them, but he, he didn't really get that opportunity to really show like how fast he was capable of running. And I think he was just chasing that and wanted to really see like how far he could take himself in the event. Um, until, you know, recently he ran 333 out in California, an amazing race. Um, and I think that'll be enough for him to take a break from the event, but I'm not yeah. certain. So uh, now he's checked that box, you know, put up one of the top Canadian 1500 times all, all time. I think he's ready to return to, uh, you know, the event that he's most well known for. And I think when he does, I, I think it's going to be pretty incredible. I think he's ready to, uh, you know, run one of the fastest times in Canadian history for sure. Well, that's the thing. As as a track guy, watching him run three thirty three, it it caught me by surprise. I was like, I knew he was good, but I didn't know he was three thirty three good. You know, especially for right. a five thousand guy, and that's so encouraging going into you know uh, you know a, a big you know championship event. You've you've seen his training. You know, like was was that a surprise when you saw the the three thirty three? Yeah, I mean, I I see Justin almost every day, and um, he is. He's phenomenal to work out with and to observe because, you know, there's there's many workouts where I'm not capable of, of hanging on to him through a full session because, um, you know, he really is just an, a, another level. Um, so <laughs> it was it was surprising in some ways and, and not in others. I mean, like we don't do with that much speed stuff like we like nothing we do prepared Justin to go out in 151 in that 1500. So mm -hmm. when I see him do something something like that, I'm just like I have no I have no idea. I could never imagine doing that based on what we do. Like right, right. it just doesn't resonate with me at all, but um 
that's kind of how he rolls. He just, I, I think he kind of throws times out the window and expectations. And it's just like, my goal is to win this race and he's willing to take risks. And, um, you know, the first time he did that in Eugene, he fell off Ollie Hoare with uh, one lap to go. And then the second time he is challenging to beat him. So um, it clearly worked for him. Uh, so, yeah, I, I knew he was going to run fast. 333 was, was I think, what we were all, like, waiting for because we knew that he looked too good running 335 and 336. Uh, but that being said, like, we don't run those splits. So mm -hmm. it's, like, it's hard to imagine – going into that race being willing to put your body in that position when you have no experience going out in 54 and 151 and then having you know another two laps to go yeah. so it's pretty crazy you guys have been making huge waves this year uh you know your your whole your entire team really has been uh but you know kind of on opposite ends of that so we just talked about justin and his 333 uh but you've had some some really uh notable marathon finishes as well too so what's uh what's what's that group like and and kind of you know which which end are you leaning towards like who who are you matching up with in workouts and stuff for sure, yeah. Um, it was so cool to see Marty and Colin both run, you know, 208 and 209 at the Marathon Project because, um, you know, really just kind of set the tone. It was it was the very end of December, heading into New Year, um, and seeing those guys represent the club so well um, was such a confidence boost to all of us and just validation that, like, wow, like, these guys are world class and, you know, we see them every day. So that was awesome. Um, it also provided me the opportunity to do a lot of, work I didn't typically do in the fall and even Justin actually hopped in you know a lot of the strength based sessions um so I got to try some new things take on some higher volume workouts run my first half marathon and uh those guys are tough man like running with those guys like they make you hurt um as we transition to the track there's some divergence um I definitely feel like I, I tend to get stuck in the middle like there's days where you know, I get FOMO because I'll go strength base and I'll watch what Justin and, you know, Alex Rogers and Rob Demanic are doing. And I'm like, oh, I want to be doing that. And there's some days I go to the track side and I look at what Colin and Marty are doing and I get FOMO being like, oh, I would have crushed that. So it's so nice to have a versatile group where, you know, you can uh, go either side of the spectrum and have, you know, the best athletes to train with. Um, so I do a bit of both. Um, at this time of year, I love the track. I get so much confidence on the track. And as I said, I think, that high intensity work takes a little bit longer for my body to adapt to. Um, so any chance I get to work out with Justin, I, I try to, I try to uh, do that. Yeah. But uh, that being said, like being able to train with any of those guys has been, um, has been awesome. And uh, the group dynamic has been great and, and the women have been crushing it and it's been really inspiring for the group as well. So, you know, having, having access to, to Marty and Colin, uh, although I understand Marty is, is moving if I, if I'm not mistaken, but ha having access to those guys and, you know, running, running that half marathon that, that you ran, uh, a little bit earlier, you know, has, has, it, has it got you thinking about, uh, you know, the future and, and where you want to be as far as that goes, you know, is, is that on the table? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the fall I was all aboard the marathon train <laughs> like not specifically because I, like i didn't have enough time i mean honestly if we did what we did that fall a year ago there's a chance i would have honestly pursued the marathon for tokyo like i was that into it and i loved wow. it and <clears throat> my confidence was in a place that i was like oh i can run you know and then i watched those guys run 208 and 209 and i'm like I would have set a Canadian record today, you know, if I, yeah. if, if I, you know, granted they were doing a lot harder and more volume in their training than I was, but seeing guys that, you know, I, I resonate with that closely and being like, wow, like what could have been, um, definitely got the gears turning quite a bit and the half marathon debut. <clears throat> that being said, hop back on the track, set a couple PRs and you never want to leave. So it's, uh, you know, when I got this question in the fall, I was definitely, of like I was like I'm all in for Tokyo on the track but after that I'll probably move up now after this track season in the the trajectory I'm on I, I could see myself staying on the track for another year but I really have a hard time believing I would do a full n another Olympic cycle <clears throat> on the track the only way I could justify doing that is if I thought I had the potential to medal in a track event and if I want to do that I need to get a lot better um not that it's off the table but, um, you know, it's just not where I'm at right now. And unless there's anything to show in the next two years that I'd be fighting for a medal in the 5K or 10K, 
um, I feel like I'd want to move up to the roads and, and start exploring that uh, while I'm still at an age where, you know, I can really get the most of myself. Yeah, no, I, I, t- I totally get that. <laughs> um, you know, one one thing that I want to want to talk to you about is, you know, we've been talking about your team, uh, Reebok Boston. Of course, you guys are not in Massachusetts. You're actually training down in Charlottesville. And that's one thing I wanted to bring up because uh, I know what a Waterloo winter is like. You know, I'm, I'm a Southern Ontario boy, and I can't imagine it's that much different in Ann Arbor. So what was what was that like being in uh, in Charlottesville this year for for the winter? That's got to be a new experience for, you, you know. Oh yeah. It's so nice. Um, yeah, I'd recommend, um, you know, anyone take a trip to Charlottesville. It's a beautiful place. Uh, the winters, you know, it's not like Florida, it gets cold, but, um, it's, there's just no stuff on the ground. And you know, all our, all our, um, teammates are from Syracuse. Mostly they all had, you know, hard, hard winters to train in. We've got a couple Texas boys who we hear complain a lot during (laughs) the winter months, but, um, for the most part, like, you just don't run into like slipping, stepping on snow throughout the runs. And I didn't realize how much I disliked that part of winter running. Like the cold mm-hmm. is fine. I mean, it also doesn't get that cold. Like, you know, it gets to minus five and you know, that's like as bad as it gets. Um, so it's really nice. I mean, it just doesn't really break up the training that much. Um, we actually don't have an indoor track there. So we stay outdoors all year long and and honestly doing you know outdoor track sessions in minus two degree weather is it has its own challenges but it's just nice to not ever have to worry about like oh do i have to run on the treadmill today am i gonna slip and slide like how slow is my easy day gonna be because i gotta like mush through all the snow um so yeah it's it's pretty nice um that being said i am embarrassed about how quickly it makes you (laughs) soft and sensitive to the cold (laughs) Because my first year, I went and visited Hannah, my girlfriend back in Michigan, because she was a golfer at at, at Michigan mm-hmm. as well. And uh, I remember just being like angry, like it was like a <laughs> minus twenty, like wind chill minus twenty five, and I was like mad. I was like, what is this? And that was this was like six months after living in Virginia. It's just like you completely change your your tolerance. Look, I I think I have a theory about this, and. It, it, you know, it's it's moving to a warmer place, but also as you get older, I think I, I found that as you get older, your threshold for when you put on tights versus when you put on shorts or half tights becomes, you know, way higher, you know, so oh, yeah. I, I used to be like minus five <clears throat> and above I'm in shorts, but now it's like plus five. I'm like, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. no, <laughs> you know, it's it's tights weather now. It's tights weather. Where, where, where are you at as far as that goes? Oh, for sure. I'm I'm way more warm than cold. I'm, you know, nowadays, man, I'm telling you, like, like 13, 14 degrees, I'll be in tights, like in Virginia. So um, on the flip side, the thing that that's wild is it gets so hot. And this is where my Texas friends laugh at me because, you know, they're way hotter. But for a Canadian or a Syracuse athlete in Virginia, like it gets hard like it's like it's it's always you know your doubles are always in 33 34 high humidity and you just get used to just like sweating like crazy and just kind of you really got to just be careful and trust your effort because um by the time august comes around you can be pretty exhausted running in those type of conditions and trying to like really push it you know let's let's go back to ann arbor for a second so uh mason Furlick. Nick Willis, those guys are they're your dudes, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And so they're back there. They they have uh, they have a, a, a very nice the very nice track club, and uh, they they made some huge news this uh, this week's week with uh, with Hobbs Kessler uh, running a new collegiate record uh, as a high school soon running a three thirty four. That's absolutely wild. I uh, you know. I'm interested as to what your take is. You're you're a little more familiar with uh with that scene that that they're training in and and Warhurst and 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 all that sort of stuff. So what what was your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's been so fun to follow. Um, and it's really cool because you know the the main benefit I I get from knowing those guys and being in Ann Arbor and knowing Ronnie and like it's cool to know that the very nice track club always always existed. You know that, that was like. Willis is kind of uh, n- like his notorious setup where he he trained in Ann Arbor while he was winning Olympic medals. He trained with Ronnie and whoever wanted to 
be a part of it was welcome to be a part of it. And they had some great athletes come in and qualify for Olympic teams for New Zealand. Um, I believe um, uh, Will Lear was little was there for a little bit from the U.S. So they actually had a ton of really good athletes come through. And, um, you know, now to see ma- people like Mason and, and Hobbs um, just completely crush it and really like, you know, amplify and, you know, put the name on on the performances, the Very Nice Track Club, and, and really give Ronnie and his training that exposure has been really cool because, you know, Ronnie's done so much. I mean, Ronnie's part of all of Nick Willis's Olympic medals, and no one really knows that much about him. Um, so it's pretty cool to see, like, the Very Nice Track Club, like, getting the recognition. Um, you know, it, it, you could argue it's always deserved in certain contexts. But um, so that's been really cool. Um, and the other thing is, like, it's just such a, like, rich tradition, like, Ronnie coached Sully. Sully coached me and Mason. A lot of Sully's workouts derive from what Ronnie created and Coach Sully. So, um, you know, the training in a lot of ways is pretty similar to what I did in college. Um, and uh, the biggest thing is those guys are just having fun with it. And to see, you know, a two-time Olymp- Olympic medalist, uh, you know, a, a pro that's no longer necessarily a pro but getting a phd and still like putting the best times up they ever have and a high school kid like as a training (laughs) group is just like the most entertaining thing to watch ever so um it's really cool i'm like very genuinely happy for those guys and everything they're accomplishing yeah it's it's wild stuff and actually i was uh, you know i mentioned to you before the interview i was uh you know talking talking with uh reed cool set my uh my westdale neighbor here and i i think on a related note like what happens in a universe where say you didn't win that NCAA title? Do you think like, do you, do you think you would have ended up as, as a part of that team or do you think that you would have continued, you know, this, this dream of pursuing the, the, the distance running thing had you won that or, or do you, do you think that uh, you would have, you know, moved back to Kitchener Waterloo or like, what do you think would have happened in an alternate universe where you didn't win that NCAA title? Yeah, that's such an interesting question because, um, you know, and the reality was I was preparing for that, alt, like, you know, alternate reality is, is uh, you know, at that time in my career before NCAAs, I had really nothing to show any company to sponsor me. Um, and I had two weeks left and my eligibility was up. So, you know, at that time I was, you know, I was looking up rock climbing memberships and hockey, you know, uh, groups to join, like, you know, just all the stuff that you do and, you know, your, your eligibility is done. Um, so I, I'll answer this a couple of ways. I, I feel like I would have kept running and in my mind, um, I, I picked up a dual masters. Um, so which I ended up dropping one of the masters be, to move to Virginia. Mm-hmm. So I actually gave myself a timeline to be in Ann Arbor for another year plus, and I was going to do my dual masters. I was probably going to continue working at the place I was doing my internship and I was going to just, you know, give it the old college try. Um, my guess would have been if I didn't have anything to show for my track credentials, I probably would have moved up to the marathon right away and just started like plugging away with, with Sully would have been, um, probably my go-to, um, so the funny thing is though, like even after winning NCAAs, like my mind was very much trying to figure out a way to make the current situation I was in at the time, uh, sustainable. So, um, I was actually actively pursuing independent sponsorships so that I could continue the, you know, I just had to break through my life. Sully and I had things figured out. And, uh, my first instinct is like, I want to, I want this to keep on going. You know, I want to find a way to, to keep doing this. And, um, you know, there's two things. One, it wasn't in the cards. I couldn't find an independent sponsorship. There was no way I was going to be able to be a, you know, a, a quote unquote pro getting paid, um, to stay with Sully. And, and that was important at the time was to get paid and just focus on running. Um, and we had that conversation and he understood being, uh, you know, the high level athlete that he was himself. Um, and then when the opportunity to be coached by Chris Fox came along, I was like, I mean, like, this is perfect, you know, yeah. like between, it was kind of like one door closes, another one opens. It was like, I can't, I can't be here. I can't make the situation work. And at the same time, this tremendous opportunity to work with a coach that I've looked up to my whole career, um, opens up, um, I got to hop on it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Sully. When we left, it was a sad, like, hey, like, it, this is definitely something that would have been sweet to, to keep doing. But, um, 
you know, unfortunately, it's just sitting on the cards. We couldn't make it work. The timing just wasn't right in a very breakup manner. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, uh, yeah, so it was tough. But, um, you know, I was really I was, I'm also really privileged to find the situation I'm in now. And Sully has been super supportive. And I talked to him about his athletes all the time. So we got a great relationship. So it's been it's been cool. Oh, it's been it's been a wild ride to, to watch for sure. And uh, yeah exciting couple months for you coming up and uh and i'm i'm really excited to uh to see it uh i know talking with uh with with my little brother he's uh he's very invested in this because every time your stock goes up his stock goes up a little bit too because of that, that <laughs> off the west qualifier that you smoked him in so yeah, it's, it's uh awesome. <laughs> so anyways man i really appreciate you taking the time uh you know and, and being on the on the show today and uh you know clearing up some some questions that that we had and it's uh it's always good to check in yeah, yeah, I had a blast. Uh, thanks, Michael, for having me on here. And uh, yeah, Canadian distance running is in a very special place right now. So uh, just grab some popcorn because uh, the next month's going to be pretty, uh, pretty sick. Big thanks and best of luck to Ben Flanagan over the coming weeks. If you like this episode, shoot us a subscribe, a like, rating, or a comment wherever you listened. And be sure to tell a couple teammates about us as well. Big thanks to you for listening. My name is Michael Rokas. This is the Terminal Mile. And I want you to support your local Twilight Mage.